Bibi and Tina, the Hungarian horseman, sunset. A muffled rattling filled the train compartment. Outside, the scenic landscape rushed by. Rolling hills, cornfields, rivers, lakes and forests, and above it all, a golden summer sun burned brightly in a cloudless sky. Bibi Blocksburg, the little witch from Newtown, gazed dreamily out the window. In the distance, she could make out the first foothills of a mountain range. Somewhere far, far beyond, she thought, lies Hungary. The passing view made her tired, and no sooner had Bibi closed her eyes when she suddenly felt someone shaking her. Hey, Bibi, no sleeping! She glanced up to find her friend, Tina, standing beside her with a reminder about their mission to find the dining car. Dining car? Oh, yes, dinner! Only now did Bibi realize how hungry she was. I'm on my way, she shouted and followed her friend out into the corridor. Bibi was in high spirits. Vacations in Hungary were simply the greatest. She and Tina had eagerly accepted an invitation from Count Falkel von Falkenstein to accompany the wild horse Stormy to Zendro Stud Farm. The stallion belonged to a friend of the Count and was used at the farm for breeding. As long as the journey was to Hungary, for Bibi it was like being on vacation. Anticipation was the greatest joy, and, as always, she loved every minute of the train ride. Tina, on the other hand, was feeling quite gloomy. This particular trip had one major drawback. Tina's boyfriend, Alexander von Falkenstein, was not allowed to come along. After getting poor grades at school, his father had insisted that he study with a private tutor during the break. At first, Alex had protested vehemently, but the Count had remained stubborn and in the end had even threatened to send his son to boarding school. So now the two friends were traveling to Hungary without Alex, a circumstance that seemed to dampen Tina's mood the entire way. Bibi had firmly set her mind on cheering up her friend. Tina certainly missed the young von Falkenstein, but there would be plenty of things at Zendro Stud to distract her, not least the wild horse Masha, which Tina already knew from her last visit. Come, Tina, said Bibi, taking Tina's arm in a show of support. We'll soon have our favorite Hungarian meal. Mmm, yes, a nice fozelik, our favorite Hungarian vegetable stew, Tina enthused. A cozy table for two was still available towards the end of the dining car. A friendly waiter came over to greet them. Jos tet kivanok. Good evening, ladies. May I show you to your seats? Bibi and Tina smiled at the formal address and enjoyed being escorted through the dining area. The waiter even moved the chairs out for them. Since they already knew what they wanted to eat, the friends sat down and immediately placed their order. Shortly afterwards, the waiter appeared again and served them two plates of steaming stew. With a yo edvegyat, he wished them a good appetite, bowed, and then moved over to four guests at a neighboring table who wanted to pay. The soft murmur of voices was unexpectedly drowned out by a booming yell. Gee, Steve, what the heck? Every table's full in here. Bibi turned around. Three men had entered the dining car. Just take it easy, Carl, said the one who'd been addressed as Steve. I'll sort it out. He was a broad-shouldered guy in his mid-twenties like the other two, with a gold chain flashing around his thick neck. The wispy blonde hair on his round head was beginning to thin out. His two companions looked rather scrawny next to him. The one Steve had called Carl was tall and thin, wearing his garishly patterned shirt unbuttoned too low. The other one, a small, wiry guy with narrow, piercing eyes, wore a baggy jogging suit. You know, the third guy snorted. Steve always manages everything. You're right, Johnny, shouted Carl, and the three of them moved towards the table next to Bibi and Tina. Steve had seen that the four guests had just paid their bill. Come on, hurry up, he snarled at them. You can talk somewhere else. Tina rolled her eyes. Those three really are lovely gentlemen, she whispered to Bibi. The four guests had already stood up to leave. They looked at Steve, Carl, and Johnny with annoyance, but said nothing more and left the dining car. The men fluttered into the free chairs and Steve snapped his fingers impatiently at the waiter. 
The best thing is not to pay any attention to them, said Bibi. But that was not so easy. After the waiter had taken their order with a visibly irritated expression on his face, the three men continued talking so loudly that Bibi and Tina couldn't hear anything else. They raved on about their last trip to Canada. Bibi nearly choked on her food. The three were boasting that they had hunted wild bears. They even called this an adventure trip. If Bibi had understood correctly, they would fire up a jeep, set traps, and hunt innocent animals. But wild horses are a completely different game, Steve warned. They're supposed to be damn fast. You have to figure out how to get behind them. Pah, snorted Johnny. I can't wait till I rope me one of those beasts. Bibi couldn't believe what she'd just heard. She immediately lost her appetite. She could see from the corner of her eye that Tina felt the same way. Bibi's friend glared angrily over at the next table, and Steve noticed. Is there a problem, Ginger? He said to Tina. Yes, there is, countered Tina. Bibi could hear her anger. Hunting wild horses is the worst thing in the world. At this, the three men burst out laughing. Bibi felt her anger rise. She wanted to turn them all into big, fat, knobbly toads. Unfortunately, she had to give Count Falco von Falkenstein her word of honor not to use magic on the journey. But the more the three laughed, the harder she found it to control herself. Hey, Blondie! Steve now shouted at her, too. What are you looking at? Bibi secretly stuck her fingers under the tabletop. Then she whispered, Eeny, meeny, winding roads, these three men will turn to... Tina hastily interrupted her. Bibi, don't. Remember what you promised. Bibi stopped the spell just in time, and Tina quickly waved the waiter over. The two friends paid. When they left the dining car, Bibi couldn't help herself and turned once more to the three men with a sinister expression on her face. Have a nice evening, Blondie, Steve shouted after her, grinning. Bibi shoved the compartment door behind her with a loud thwack. The two friends were still troubled by the dining car incident when, about a half an hour later, the train made a long stop in a mountain village to restock supplies. Bibi and Tina had agreed with the train conductor before their departure that they would look after the wild horses during the trip. Tina took some treats and went out onto the platform with Bibi, where the conductor was already waiting for them. He led them to the cargo wagon at the end of the train and opened the door for the girls. Here you are, ladies, he said. Like the waiter in the dining car, he took a small polite bow. Cousinom, replied Bibi, who remembered the Hungarian word for thank you. As she climbed into the carriage with Tina, the two were greeted by a joyful neigh. Stormy snorted and huffed. Bibi patted the stallion on the neck, and Tina gave him the treats. Yes, my brave Stormy, Bibi whispered to him. Everything was going just fine for the horse. He didn't even seem a bit nervous. Bibi and Tina knew that Stormy had been transported by train before, and he clearly wasn't bothered by such a long journey. The train conductor motioned to the friends that the trip was about to continue and that it was time to return to their car. Bibi and Tina hugged Stormy goodbye and wished him good night. Tina took a deep breath of clear, fresh mountain air as she walked back along the train with Bibi. Somehow everything feels wrong on this vacation, she sighed. First Alex isn't allowed to come, and then we meet these three buffoons in the dining car. A church tower bell rang out nine o'clock its sound echoing throughout the range. Bibi's gaze wandered over the mountainside to where the sun was setting, bathing the peaks in a luminous red. It looked as if they were glowing. Look how beautiful it is, Bibi tried to cheer up her friend. She remembered an old saying, and immediately her heart felt lighter again. Don't you know what that red glow means? Red skies at night, horse riders delight. That's a good sign. Bibi finally managed to make Tina smile. You'll see, said Bibi confidently, even without Alex, our stay at Zendro Stud will still be great. Big Disappointment While the train wound through the mountains at night without any further stops, Bibi and Tina slept peacefully in their cabin, dreaming of their horses, the wild Putsta, and beautiful days at Zendro Stud Farm. Bibi was awoken the next morning by a tickle in her nose. Through a slight opening in the curtain, a ray of sunshine fell straight across Bibi's face. With an, ah, she bolted up, wide awake. She jumped out of bed and drew the curtains. Outside, 
A huge lake glistened in the morning sun. Its banks stretched endlessly to the horizon, and sailboats drifted through the gentle waves. Bibi knew this place. It was Lake Balaton, the biggest lake in all of Hungary. It would be some time before they reached Kerakesh. Nevertheless, Bibi was already quite excited. Wake up, Tina, she called and shook her friend. We're in Hungary. Tina yawned and stretched. When she looked out the window, her face lit up. The two friends went to freshen up. When they returned to their cabin, the train conductor met them in the corridor pushing a snack car. He wished them good morning with a cheerful, Jorgel. What will it be, ladies? He asked. A light breakfast? That was exactly what Bibi and Tina had in mind. As the girls finished their tea and croissants, the vast plains of the Pusta spread out before them. The train made several stops in smaller towns until finally their stop was announced over the loudspeakers. Kerakesh! Bibi and Tina collected their luggage and left the cabin. Through the windows in the corridor, they watched a few passing farms and the first houses of Kerakesh before slowly approaching the station. Bibi's heart beat faster. Only a few people were waiting in front of the small station house. Bibi looked for Mikosh, but could not find his black curly hair anywhere. Wouldn't he have come by carriage to pick up Bibi and Tina, as he usually did? He's probably just late, said Tina, who had noticed Bibi's disappointed face. Let's get Stormy out of cargo first. Tina's right, thought Bibi. For sure, Mikosh was just late and would go straight to the station building with the carriage. Apart from the two girls, only a few travelers had gotten out. Bibi and Tina saw that the train conductor was at the far end and had already extended the ramp of the transport car. While they were still walking alongside the train, a wagon door suddenly opened beside them. A suitcase flew onto the platform in a high arc, nearly missing both Bibi and Tina. Two more bags hit the ground with a thud as three sleepy figures shuffled hurriedly out of the car. Man, you guys, I told you we shouldn't have been sleeping so late. At once, Bibi's hands formed into fists as last night's rage returned. The men who stumbled out of the wagon were none other than the three guys from the dining car. Steve cursed and scolded as he picked up his bag from the ground. He didn't seem to have had time to comb his hair because his thin blonde strands were sticking straight up on end. All three men were wearing the same clothes as the previous evening. Judging by the wrinkles and folds, it was clear that they had slept in them. Can you turn it down, Steve? Carl moaned. I've got a nasty headache. That really sent Steve into a fury. But Bibi didn't hear much of his ranting because Tina had quickly pulled her away. What a stupid coincidence, she hissed. They had to get off here in Kerakesh, of all places. Do you think they'll stay around here? Bibi asked, horrified. Tina shook her head. They'll probably rent a car and drive on into the Pusta, where it's really lonely, and where they can hunt wild horses undisturbed, Bibi added grimly. Stormy lowered his head calmly when Bibi and Tina entered the carriage. The stallion whinnied and snorted happily, letting himself be let out easily onto the platform. The train conductor climbed up the ramp once more and brought out Stormy's saddle to the girls. I wish you a wonderful stay here in Kerakesh, he said. Bibi and Tina thanked him and ran over to the station building. The platform was now deserted. There was nothing more to see of Steve, Carl, and Johnny, but nothing of Mikosh either. This stung Bibi a little. Has Mikosh forgotten us? She wondered. That's strange, said Tina, beginning to feel Bibi's concern. If Mikosh had other plans, then I'm sure Janusz would be here to pick us up. Minute by minute, the hand of the station clock jumped forward with a loud clack. Almost half an hour had passed since they arrived in Kerakesh. I guess we'll have no choice but to walk, Tina said. It was quite a long way to Zendro Stud Farm. The sun was high in the sky, and it was scorching hot. They'd certainly work up quite a sweat on their way. But neither the long walk nor the heat were as bad for Bibi as the thought of having been stood up by Mikosh. Come on, Bibi, don't be downhearted, Tina comforted her friend. It'll all make sense once we get there. Bibi nodded slightly and strapped her bag to the saddle. When Tina had also fastened hers, they set off with Stormy. The girls walked around the station house and stepped out into the street. It must not have rained for weeks, as Stormy's hooves stirred up the dust on the cobblestones. The station was on the edge of Kerakesh, 
and the three of them soon reached the main road. It was very quiet in the midday heat. Not a single bird could be heard from the avenue trees lining the road. Only the clatter of Stormy's hooves and somewhere, far away, a dog barking. Bibi and Tina both turned in shock as the sound of an engine came roaring up behind them, shattering the silence as it shot towards the girls and the wild horse. A car was approaching from Kerakesh, driving way too fast. The windows were rolled down, and music blared from inside what they could now see was a bright green jeep. Stormy whinnied and danced nervously on the spot. Bibi held the rope with both hands while Tina tried to calm the wild horse. Together, they led Stormy to a shady spot under one of the avenue trees. The jeep easily had enough road to steer wide around them, but instead the driver cut it close and floored the gas pedal, vrooming past Bibi, Tina, and the wild horse. Everything went incredibly fast. For a fleeting moment, Bibi and Tina caught a glimpse of who was sitting inside the car. Nobody else but Steve, Carl, and Johnny. The three men laughed and roared gloatingly as they shot past the girls and the wild horse. Stormy panicked and reared upwards. Bibi couldn't hold him anymore. The rope was torn from her hands and she fell backwards into the grass. Whoa, easy, easy, cried Tina. She kept a safe distance from the stallion's front hooves before finally getting hold of the halter. Bibi grabbed the lead. Everything's all right, whispered Tina into the ear of the trembling Stormy, while Bibi patted his neck. Only when the jeep was far away, when both the music and engine noise had faded into silence, did the stallion again regain composure. These guys are dangerous, Tina wailed. Bibi considered that maybe she'd been wrong all along to think they'd have a lovely vacation in Hungary. To the contrary, Tina was sad because Alex had not been allowed to come. She, Bibi, was disappointed because Mikush had not picked them up from the station. And now this encounter with Steve, Carl, and Johnny. If it went on like this, the trip would be a disaster. A bad sign. Bibi and Tina continued their route with Stormy through the scorching midday heat. The avenue trees, which had previously provided them with shade, lined the road only until the next crossing. From that point on, there was nothing above the girls but the deep blue sky and a piercing summer sun. Again and again, Bibi wondered why Mikosh had not picked them up at the station. She was less disappointed than upset by it, and the longer they had to go, the more angry she got that Mikosh had let them walk all the way. No sooner had the girls begun to worry about missing the turnoff to Zendro Stud when Bibi spotted a signpost through the flickering hot air. It pointed left in the direction of a narrow dirt road. They came closer to read the lettering. Zendro, at last! When the dirt road made a bend, they saw the stud farm up ahead. The thatched white houses glowed brightly in the glaring sunlight. Bibi looked out for Mikosh, but could see neither him nor Janusz. Not a soul was to be found in the whole yard. The two girls called out for Mikosh and Janusz, but neither came to greet them. The only answer Bibi and Tina received was a joyous barking coming from behind the stud farm. A big dog came bounding around the corner of the house, wagging his tail. With his brown fur and salt and pepper markings, he almost looked like a wolf. He had a white spot on his neck, to which he owed his name, Snowball. This mongrel not only looked similar to a wolf, but he had also been raised by them. After Mikosh, Alex, Bibi, and Tina had found and rescued him one day, they all decided he should live at Zendra Stud. He had recognized the girls' voices immediately, and now he jumped up playfully back and forth between them. Hey, take it easy, Snowball, laughed Tina. Yes, we missed you too, cried Bibi. She crouched down and the dog licked her face to greet her. The reunion with Snowball did them good. During the first few moments of their arrival, the girls had felt like strangers on the deserted stud farm. Now they felt comforted by the unexpected welcome. But the stud farm was not quite as deserted as Bibi and Tina had thought. While the two of them frolicked around with Snowball, they did not notice that someone else was coming around the corner of the house. It was a man of Janusz's age with a thick gray mustache. He stopped in the shadow of the thatched roof and watched the girls smiling for a while before addressing them. 
Well, well, well. Who do we have here? Bibi and Tina looked up in surprise. They'd never seen this man before at the stud farm. He winked at them with his friendly brown eye, and the girls found him quite personable. When they introduced themselves, the man raised his thick, bushy eyebrows in amazement. You arrived today already? Janos didn't expect you until next week. He is still at another stud farm and won't return until tonight. Oh, excuse me. He removed his wide-brimmed hat and introduced himself to the two girls. May I? Andreas is my name. I've been lending a hand here at the stud farm for some time now, and my help is needed more than ever since... He interrupted himself. Bibi listened intently. What did Andreas want to say? Yes, since what? she asked. But Andreas shook his head. Nothing, uh, nothing, he muttered, and then called out. But first of all, Udvizoyuk, welcome you two. Bibi shot a glance at her friend Tina. She too seemed surprised that Andreas hadn't finished his sentence. The old man quickly busied himself by helping unstrap the luggage from the saddle and then loosening Stormy's girth. We'll tend to the horse first, and then I'll take you to the guest room. You must be starving after your long journey. Bibi and Tina left their travel bags on the veranda in front of the house and followed Andreas, who led Stormy to the stable. It appeared as though the roof there was being repaired. A ladder was leaning against the wall next to a pile of straw. Andreas made a wide detour around it, which Bibi and Tina found a bit strange. They took the shortest way to the stable entrance and were just about to go under the ladder when Andreas flinched violently. Waving his arms and showering the girls with a flood of Hungarian sentences neither of them could understand. Only when he said loudly, Stop! Stop! Back! They understood what he wanted to tell them. Andreas took a deep breath as the girls moved slowly away from the ladder. What was that all about? Bibi asked, bewildered. What's so dangerous about the ladder? Andreas was so excited that he broke out in a cold sweat. He wiped his forehead with a handkerchief before he could answer. Don't you know what great misfortune that brings? He grumbled and rolled his eyes theatrically. Bad luck? When you go under a ladder? Bibi could only shake her head at that, but Tina had heard about it before. It's superstition, she whispered to Bibi as they followed Andreas into the stable. Oh, you mean something like, a four-leaf clover brings good luck? Bibi asked quietly. But not quietly enough. Andreas had heard their conversation. It's not superstition, he shouted with a raised forefinger. You must never go under a ladder. Do you hear? Andreas began to lecture Bibi and Tina about what events lead to great misfortune. Black cats crossing your path from right to left. Owls calling on the roof of a house or a broken mirror which meant seven years of bad luck. But the worst thing is, Andreas muffled his voice as if to ward off misfortune and announced, The Delibob. Delibob? Bibi asked. What is it? Oh, a bad sign. Andreas explained to the girls that a Delibob is a mirage that one could see out over the Pusta on hot summer days. It was something like an optical illusion in the desert or when faraway places suddenly appeared and seemed to be within reach. A delibob confuses the senses, Andreas exclaimed. Believe me, it brings bad luck. Only a few days ago, Andreas had seen one of these mirages over the Pusta. Dismayed, he had run to Janusz, who'd never been interested in premonitions or bad signs in the first place. Janusz had laughed, but Andreas interrupted his story for a moment. He had reached a free stall and led Stormy inside. Here, my dearest, he whispered to the wild horse. Eat your fill first. He shoveled hay and oats into a manger and then closed the stall door. But, asked Bibi, who eagerly wanted to know what misfortune this Delibab was supposed to have brought. She wasn't only asking out of curiosity. It had not escaped her attention that Andreas had told her about Janusz, but he didn't once mention another name, Mikosh. But then came misfortune, Andreas continued with wide gestures. Dissension and strife befell Zendro Stud. Janos no longer laughed when Mikos suddenly... Bibi was bursting with anticipation. Tina's wide eyes were fixed on Andreas. 
but he was frozen, afraid to utter his own words. He looked from one girl to another, lowered his arms, and muttered hastily, I didn't say anything. Please, Andreas, begged Bibi. What about Mikosh? I haven't said anything, Andreas repeated. Yes, you have, Tina urged. You said that misfortune has befallen Zendro Stud Farm. Andreas was suddenly in a great hurry to leave the stable. Misfortune? Yes, yes, uh, there's a lot of misfortune in the world, he offered, avoiding the questions of two inquisitive friends. The girl stayed close behind him as he ran out into the yard. Bibi was determined not to let up. You just told us, she said emphatically, that Janos hadn't laughed anymore when something happened with Mikosh. What was that about? But Andreas just shook his head, and again his only answer to Bibi was, I didn't say anything. Bibi and Tina understood that there was nothing more to be gained from Andreas. For whatever reason, he remained silent. He helped them take their luggage to the guest room and then went with them to the kitchen. There was a pot of vegetable soup on the stove, which he warmed up for them, and from the refrigerator he took a jug of homemade lemonade. He apologized that he still had urgent work to do, and left the two girls alone. After Bibi and Tina had had lunch, they went to look for the horses Tango and Masha. They found them in the second stable building behind the grain silo. The two wild horses were obviously happy to see the girls again which was a comfort the friends needed after their strange reception at the stud. They were eager to talk to Janos. Andreas had said that he wouldn't be back until the evening, so the girls spent the afternoon riding around the farm. Tango and Masha hadn't been ridden in a long time and were whinnying happily as they galloped through the high grass of the pusta with Bibi and Tina on their backs. In the evening, Janos finally returned to the stud farm on his tractor. But if Bibi and Tina had hoped to learn more about Mikosh now, they were in for big disappointment. Janos looked worn out and exhausted as the two girls ran toward him in the yard. Having met Andreas on the way in, he already knew that Bibi and Tina had arrived. Janos was visibly sorry, almost contrite about the fact that he had mistaken the girls' arrival time and had not picked them up at the station. Apart from that, however, he was not very talkative. Bibi and Tina did not dare to ask him about Mikosh at first. Only when the three of them had eaten dinner on the veranda did Bibi work up her courage. Janos, she began. The sun had just sunk below the horizon, and Janos seemed to be far away with his thoughts. Andreas told us about a great misfortune, Bibi continued cautiously. Janos frowned. A misfortune? Yes, he said something about quarrels and discord, Tina helped her friend. Janos seemed to gradually understand what the two girls were getting at. His face darkened, and he crossed his arms in front of his chest. I don't want to talk about that rascal, he muttered. Rascal? Bibi repeated in amazement. What had happened? Janos had always been a fatherly friend to Mikosh, standing by the orphaned boy in all his troubles. Please, Janos. Tina made a second attempt. We're worried about Mikosh. Janusz took a long while to consider his answer, grumpily gnawing on a toothpick that he shuffled from side to side. This rascal, he finally spoke, has left Zendra Stud Farm. What? shouted Bibi, stunned. It can't be! She saw that Janusz had tears in his eyes. Nevertheless, his voice sounded hard and cold when he said, Mikosh is gone, and it's better that way. Riddle about Mikosh That night, Tina had tossed and turned restlessly. She had had a bad dream and woke up late the next morning. It took Tina a little while to realize where she was and notice that Bibi was no longer in her bed. Her clothes were gone from the chair where she had neatly folded them in the evening, and since Bibi's helmet had also disappeared, she must have gone riding. Tina decided to get up and look for her friend. She also had a hunch where she might be. After she got up and washed herself, Tina slipped into her riding clothes, took her helmet, and went out of the house. In the stable, Masha welcomed her with a loud neigh. After she had cleaned, saddled, and bridled the mare, Tina jumped up and rode out into the pusta. The place where Tina expected to find her friend was a good distance from Zendro's stud. It was Mikosh's summer cottage, where Bibi and Mikosh had spent a lot of time together. She found Bibi in Mikosh's hammock, 
which Bibi had stretched between the hut and a mighty old chestnut tree. She looked tired and sad. Tina sat down in the hammock next to Bibi and put one arm around her friend. For a while, neither of them spoke a word. I couldn't sleep anymore, Bibi finally broke the silence. And I didn't want to wake you, so I went off on my own. You're worried about how Mikosh is doing, aren't you? Tina asked. Yes, replied Bibi, but I'm a bit angry too. Mikosh can't just run away like that. Has he forgotten all about me? Mikosh certainly hasn't forgotten you, Tina reassured her friend. But why had he simply disappeared like that? And what had Mikosh and Janosch argued about so intensely? I absolutely must speak with Mikosh, Bibi said decidedly. Janosch and Andreas have to know where he is. I'll pressure them until they tell me. With that, Bibi jumped up. Tango and Masha raised their heads and trotted over from the draw well. The two girls swung into their saddles and galloped back to the stud farm. Bibi and Tina could see from afar that the tractor wasn't in the yard. Janos seemed to be on the road again. But Andreas had seen them arrive at the back of the stable, where he was repairing the paddock fence. Snowball ran towards them, barking happily as they came around the house. The girlfriends unhitched their horses, which were still quite hot and sweaty from the gallop, rubbed their hair with straw, and tied them in the shade under the stable roof to let them cool off. Behind the barn... Bibi confronted Andreas without hesitation. He seemed to be afraid that the girls might ask him about Mikosh again, and at first he tried to talk his way out of it. He had said something about quarreling? Oh yes, the Delibab, the Mirage, the evil sign? Yes, there had been a disagreement between Mikosh and Janosch, but he knew nothing more about it. Bibi did not give up, and soon Tina also spoke up. Mikosh rode out into the Pusta all alone? She wanted to know. Uh, but no, he followed the Chicos, Andreas babbled away. When he realized what had just slipped out of his mouth, he cringed and stammered. I, I didn't say anything. I said nothing. But now it was certainly too late for excuses. Who are these Chicos? Bibi asked. And why did Mikos follow them? Sighing, Andreas sat down on the fence and began to tell the story from the beginning. The beginning was, and remained for Andreas, that darned Deliba. He had seen it in the morning, but at first nothing more happened than that Janusz received a call from Count Falkel von Falkenstein around noon. The Count and Janusz talked about the wild horse, Stormy, and other matters concerning Zendro Stud Farm. When they also talked about Mikosh, the Count remarked that it was high time to send the boy to a proper school. After all, he would need a diploma if he was to become anything at all. The two finally agreed that it would be best for Mikosh if he went to a boarding school, which the Count also wanted to support financially. Because the boy only ever had horses on his mind, the boarding school should be as far away from the stud farm as possible, in the Hungarian capital, Budapest. There, Mikosh would have minimal distractions. Bibi could not imagine this at all. Mikosh? In a big city? That would never work out. That's what Mikos said when Janos spoke to him about it, Andreas continued. But Janos could not be dissuaded from this idea. He insisted that Mikos should go to school right after the summer vacation. The boy had protested loudly against it. He would never part with his beloved horse, Baboshko. Janos remained unyielding, and as a result, a fierce argument broke out between the two. Then I'd rather ride with the Chicos! Mikos had shouted before jumping on the back of his horse and riding off. That was the great misfortune that Delibob had delivered. Andreas gazed out at the pusta with a gloomy look. But who are these chicos? Bibi urged. As far as she had understood, it was bad enough that Mikos had left the stud farm just like that. But the real problem seemed to be these chicos. They were the reason why Janos did not want to talk about Mikos anymore. Who are the chicos? Andreas slowly repeated Bibi's question. His look darkened even more when he said, Janos thinks the Chicos are prowlers. Even worse, he says the Chicos are outlaws. Bibi and Tina couldn't believe what they heard. That was completely out of the question. Their Mikosh, who they knew for so long, went and joined a gang of criminals? The Hungarian Horseman Yes, and I'll say it again. They are criminals, thieves, idiots. Bibi and Tina were pacing back and forth. 
They had listened to Andreas' story so eagerly that they hadn't even noticed when Janusz drove his tractor into the yard by the other side of the stables. The chicos, he cried. As he did so, his face flushed red with anger. Stealing like ravens! They are losers! Janusz, you know that I have a different opinion, Andreas contradicted him. There's something of the chicos in every Hungarian. Pah! Janusz retorted scornfully. You cannot deny, Andreas insisted, that the Hungarians were once a great nation of horsemen. The Hungarians, or Magyars, as they called themselves, were once a nation of nomads, proud horsemen who roamed the land on their steed. They came from the far east and traveled across vast regions until finally reaching the Carpathian flatland, which is now called the Great Hungarian Plain. Only here they settled down and founded the Hungarian kingdom. All this happened ages ago. But however many centuries have passed since then, through the eventful history of the Hungarian people, many traditions have still been preserved to this day. Deep inside us, Andreas said thoughtfully, we are still the wild riders of prehistoric times, and there is nothing more beautiful and inspiring for us than to hunt across the open pusta on horseback. The Chicos, Andreas continued, had upheld many of the traditions. They were horse herders who, like the old Magyars, wandered the country as nomads with their herds. They were considered the best riders of the Pusta and admired for their arts. Some people, however, viewed the Chicos with disdain because of their unsteady life. Like Janusz, they called the horse herders drifters or accused them of theft. But to Andreas, this amounted to nothing more than prejudice. The Chicos also passed by the Zendro stud farm once or twice a year. This time they had pitched their tents not far from Mikos's summer cottage, and the boy had made friends with them. If only I had forbidden him to do that, Janusz complained. Make friends with Chicos! How can one be so foolish? Bibi was pensive. Somehow she could understand Mikos. He had always had a wild and free life at Zendro Stud, and now he was supposed to attend boarding school in a big city. Baboshko and all the other horses that he loved so dearly, he would only be able to see on vacations. Sure, thought Bibi, school is important, but a boarding school like that would be a nightmare for Mikosh. Meanwhile, Tina had come up with a completely different idea. Tell me, Janusz, she began carefully, did you actually try to get Mikosh back? Janusz was visibly uncomfortable with the question. I, um, I was angry, he mumbled. Besides, I thought it was just typical nonsense for a boy of that age. I was convinced he would come back, and I still believe it now. Janusz had taken the greatest care to sound as if he truly believed his own words. The way that he now nervously twirled his mustache, however, showed that he wasn't quite so sure. For Bibi, it was a monstrous story. Mikos and Janusz falling out, and Mikos far, far away in the pusta with a group of horse herders. She absolutely had to talk to him. Maybe she could succeed in doing what Janusz hadn't even attempted to do in his anger, to persuade Mikos to return to Zendro. She asked Andreas and Janusz if they knew where the horse herders had gone. Further northeast, Andreas replied. There lies Hortobaji a place to which the Chicos always return. Janusz examined Bibi urgently. He knew the little witch well enough to know that she had long since concocted a plan. Why do you want to know that? he asked. Because I will ride after him, said Bibi resolutely. Janusz rolled his eyes. That was exactly the answer he had feared. You want to ride alone through the pusta and find Mikosh? I'm not alone, Bibi countered. Tina is with me. And of course our horses, Tango and Masha, Tina added. Someone else joined in the conversation with loud barking. Snowball. He bounced excitedly from one to the other, jumping between Bibi and Tina before angling his head at Janusz with big, faithful doggy eyes. Janusz sighed. He knew that Bibi would never forget the idea. Together with Tina, she would do everything she could to find Mikosh. But why shouldn't the girls actually try? They were familiar with Tango and Masha. Snowball would certainly take good care of the two of them, 
and in an emergency, but only in an emergency, Bibi could also use magic. Very well, said Janos. Ride to Hortobaji, but if you don't find Mikos there, turn right around and come back. Do we understand each other? The two girls rejoiced. Bibi certainly had not thought that Janos could be persuaded so quickly. But Janos was simply happy, and in his heart, relieved that the friends wanted to ride after Mikos. During all those days with Mikos already gone, his bad conscience tore at him, and he was worried about the boy. Bibi and Tina's departure for the Pusta was decided. Andreas called his sister, Ersabet, who lived in Hotobaji. She assured him that she would be happy to accommodate the two girls. She also promised to find out if a group of chicos had arrived in the last few days. After lunch, Bibi, Tina, and Andreas put together some equipment for the trekking ride. With all the preparations, the afternoon went by in a flash. Dinner was cooked by Janos, as usual, Hungarian stew, according to his special recipe. When everyone was completely full, Janos spread out a map on the table. He showed Bibi and Tina the best way to ride to Hortobaji. You do know how to use a compass, right? Because there might not be any reception out there at all. Of course, Bibi and Tina knew that. After all, they had often been on a trail ride, even in the Pusta together with Mikos. But it was good that Janos explained the exact way to them. For most of their journey, they would ride through flat terrain. Any elevation on the horizon would help them with their orientation. But most importantly, they should always check the direction on the compass. Janos pointed to some lines that were highlighted on the map, just north of Kerakesh. The lines marked a chain of hills, at the foot of which was a small oak grove where the girls were to set up on their first night. It's a good place to camp, Janos assured them. It's sheltered from the wind, and there's also a small spring with clear, fresh water. Janos strongly recommended that they fill their water bottles there. Further north would lead them through swampy terrain, which was dry in midsummer and not too dangerous for horse and rider. Nevertheless, it was better for them to stay on the same paths where the gulyash, the cow herders, drove their cattle. The next night, they could pitch their tents at an old abandoned windmill, and on the third day, if they followed the compass and remained eastward, they would reach Hortobaji over the famous arched bridge around noon. Janos folded the map, and Andreas gave Bibi and Tina a piece of paper on which he had written down his sister's address. It was almost nine o'clock in the evening, and seeing as the girls wanted to leave at daybreak, they wished Janos and Andreas a good night and went to their room. A good sign. Tango tossed his head back and emitted a long, bright neighing sound which Masha joined in chorus. The two wild horses sensed that something was in the air when Bibi and Tina took them out of their stalls early that morning. The friends cleaned Tango and Masha thoroughly while Snowball frolicked about. After brushing the horses' manes and tails, Bibi and Tina bridled and saddled them, then loaded their supplies. Janos and Andreas got up very early as usual. They too came to the stable to say goodbye to Bibi and Tina. Janos had wrapped several packages of provisions for them, which the two girls put in their saddlebags. He cautioned them once again not to ride further than Hortobaji if Mikos and the horse herders were not there. To the east of Hortobaji lies the Erdospusta, the forest pusta, Janos explained. It is much rougher and wilder than the pusta you know, and you can easily get lost there. But after this warning, Janos still had something on his mind. If you find Mikos, he began hesitantly. Well, I must admit that I miss him a lot. Perhaps you could tell him that everything can still be discussed. You know, this thing with the boarding school. We'll tell him that, Tina promised. We'll bring Mikos back. I'm sure of it, Bibi added. Janos was deeply moved. Oh, that would really just be the best, he sighed, and blew his nose forcefully into a big checkered handkerchief. He wished them good luck as they mounted their horses and rode off the farm. And you take good care of the two girls for me, Yana shouted to Snowball. Arr -arr -arr, he barked, dashing past Tango and Masha to lead the small group. Once more, the girls waved goodbye. Yana waved back, and Andreas waved his wide-brimmed hat. 
It was a glorious, sunny morning without a single cloud in the sky. The air was cool and a light, fresh breeze was blowing. Come noon, it would surely be as hot as the days before. Bibi and Tina rode at a leisurely pace, the right speed for a long trail ride. Tina pulled out the compass and waited for the needle to indicate their direction. It fixed on north, and Bibi and Tina looked for a marker on the horizon where they could find their bearings. Far away, they spotted a small hill that could serve as a reference point, and so the girls headed onwards in that direction as they rode. In the morning, they only took short breaks every now and then to drink a sip of water. It wasn't until they had reached the hill at noon that they decided to rest for a while. The girls removed the tack from their horses, set up a mobile paddock for them to graze freely, and spread out a picnic blanket next to the fence. Janos had also thought of giving them supplies for Snowball. Tina emptied the dog food she had brought into an old tin bowl. Snowball inhaled it with a ravenous appetite, while Bibi unpacked a box of sandwiches from her saddlebag. After the girls had eaten their fill, they stretched out on the picnic blanket and looked up into the blue summer sky. Bibi was rather sleepy. Tina yawned as well, but figured it wasn't the best idea to take a nap in the blazing sun. The morning breeze had died down by now, and the heat was so intense that the two friends decided it was better to set off again. Bibi found it quite difficult to shake off her drowsiness. She thought she was daydreaming when a small town appeared in the middle of the pusta, bathed in the midday haze. The picture was strangely blurred, but she could distinguish between church towers and several houses. But Bibi was not dreaming. Tina had seen the little town too. The girls studied their map but found no place marked on it anywhere near. At the edge of the town, they saw a bridge with nine arches, and they remembered what Janusz had told them the previous night. Such a bridge led to Hortobaji. But how could Bibi and Tina at this relaxed walking pace, have covered the entire distance in only half a day. That was impossible. Janos had estimated it would take them at least two full days before they arrived. Suddenly, the picture faded. The church towers and houses became transparent and vanished into thin air. Moments later, the picture became clear again. But now, everything had doubled. Even more houses and church towers appeared before Bibi and Tina's eyes and now there were two nine-arched bridges. Bibi and Tina froze. Snowball, Tango, and Masha also became restless at the eerie sight. The dog howled while the two wild horses snorted nervously. As fast as it had come, the illusion had disappeared again, and in front of the two riders lay once more the Pusta's seemingly endless deserted landscape. Tina was the first to catch it. I think I know what we just saw. You mean that was a Delibab? Bibi asked. A mirage? Tina nodded. But don't take that as a bad sign, she warned her friend. Bibi shook her head. Don't worry. She couldn't forget all of Andreas's talk about the Delibabs. Further out on her ride across the steppe, she had to remember that Janos and Mikos had fallen out with each other on the very day that Andreas had seen such a mirage. Nonsense, Bibi finally decided in silence. One has nothing to do with the other. But the Delibab had led them astray, and Tina had to use the compass to correct their course. After a while, the ridge of the hills that Janusz had spoken of appeared in the distance. There, they would set up their first camp for the night. It took them the whole afternoon to reach the woods at the foot of the ridge. A stream rippled in the shade of old oak trees, and they followed its course to the spring. It was wonderfully cool there. Snowball guzzled greedily from the stream. Tango and Masha were also thirsty after the long ride through the scorching heat. Tina had chosen a nice place for the tent and spotted where they could build a campfire near the bank of the creek. But first the girls wanted to take a break. They took off their riding boots, rolled up their pants, and let their feet dangle in the cool water. Meanwhile, Snowball romped along the stream, scared a water bird, and bolted after a rabbit, which quickly disappeared in its burrow under a tree root. At once, Snowball burst into a fit of barking. What is it, Snowball? cried Tina. Perhaps the dog had sensed danger? But there was nothing to be seen in any direction. Snowball wouldn't stop. Perhaps he wants to show us something, Bibi thought. The two girls got up and sauntered over to the anxious dog, who now ran back and forth, tail wagging, always circling around the same spot. The grass was a bit flattened, 
and Bibi saw that there was something lying on the ground. It was a pocket knife. Bibi recognized it immediately. A squiggly M was engraved in the handle. Bibi shouted, Tina, it's Mikosh's knife. She could hardly believe it. So Mikosh had been here, at the exact spot where Bibi and Tina wanted to pitch their tent. He had also pitched camp with the Chicos. They were on the right track. Mikosh had indeed written with the horse herders to Hertobaji. You can say what you want, cried Bibi, beaming with joy. But this is clearly a good sign. Good news, bad news. That evening, Bibi and Tina were in high spirits. Both were firmly convinced that they would soon find Mikosh. They happily put up their tent, collected dry branches in the small wood, and made a fireplace with stones from the creek. As the evening set in, they sat around the crackling campfire. For supper, they had potatoes, which the girls had roasted in the embers. Bibi wondered what Mikosh was doing, whether he was also sitting around a campfire, together with Achikos, whether he was looking up at the stars as well, or maybe he was thinking of Bibi as she was thinking of him now. Soon, Mikosh, Bibi whispered, soon we'll meet again. The girls decided to go to sleep. Snowball curled up in front of the entrance and would bark immediately if he sensed danger. But in the night, everything remained silent. Bibi and Tina slept soundly until the next morning. They washed themselves in the clear stream and after a hearty breakfast, set off for their next voyage. They soon came to the swampy terrain Janusz had told them about. They followed his advice and stayed on the narrow paths that the herds of cattle had trampled into the ground. They hadn't yet seen anything of the cattle on whose paths they rode. It was only when they had crossed most of the swamp area in the afternoon that they encountered a herd. These were Hungarian steppe cattle, mighty animals, towering over Tango and Masha by a full head length. They had grayish-black hides and broad horns, thicker than a strong man's arm. Bibi and Tina were not at all comfortable when they rode past them, and they tried to give the horns a wide berth. Don't worry, my cattle are quite peaceful, shouted a kindly elderly gentleman. It was the Guriash, the cattle herder. Bibi and Tina talked to him for a while and told him where they were going. You love and respect nature, he said, unlike your compatriots in the jeep yesterday. The two friends suspected something bad. A jeep had passed by here? Three men were sitting in it, reported the herder. They lassoed my animals. There was no doubt. It could only have been those three guys from the train, Steve, Carl, and Johnny. Did they catch one of the cattle? Bibi asked in horror. Fortunately, they had not. The herdsman recounted to the girls how he had run after the jeep, ranting, which then drove off in a southeasterly direction. So not to Hortobaji, remarked Tina with relief, who had already feared that they might run into the men again. It was time for the girls to ride on. They said goodbye to the kind herdsman, who wished them all the best for their journey. Vizond Latasha, he shouted after them. Goodbye. Several hours had passed when Bibi and Tina reached the abandoned windmill that Janos had recommended for their campsite. The area around the mill was dry, so the friends could pitch their tent without any concern. Tina used a wooden bucket to scoop water from the mill's draw well and give Tango, Masha, and Snowball a drink. That evening, Bibi and Tina again sat around a cozy, crackling campfire and braised peppers in a small pan from their camping gear. They also ate bread, which they toasted over the fire. Both Bibi and Tina could feel their eyelids getting heavy. The ride through the swamp had been exhausting. Although it wasn't late, they decided to go to bed they put out the fire and slipped into their tent. Despite her exhaustion, it took Bibi a while to fall asleep. Tomorrow they would reach Hortobaji. Tomorrow she might see Mikosh again. Tomorrow... With this thought, she finally fell asleep. The next morning, Bibi was too excited to eat any breakfast. Tina managed to persuade her to have a cup of tea and a slice of bread with the delicious pusta honey that Janusz had given them. But as soon as they were finished... Bibi was eager to leave their lovely windmill campground behind. After the two friends had groomed and bridled the horses, they stowed the camping equipment in their saddlebags and set off for their last leg of the journey. They always followed the compass eastwards, as Janusz had told them, 
The wind had picked up a bit, and the route was pleasant to ride. The way led them through gentle hills with lush green meadows. After about two hours, Bibi and Tina came to a river, and only a little while later, the small town they had seen in the mirages appeared in the distance. Hotobaji. At noon, they reached the famous Nine Arch Bridge, which crossed high above the water. Once in the town, they found themselves caught in a colorful hustle and bustle of a weekly market. Bibi and Tina, leading their horses by the reins, made their way carefully through the crowd. Snowball did not leave their side. They asked a potter for the address that Andreas had written down on a piece of paper, but the man could not understand them and shook his head. The girls had better luck at a vegetable stand. The farmer's wife showed them the way using wild gestures. Bibi and Tina thanked her and were soon glad to get out of the hoard. Tango and Masha were already restless, and even Snowball didn't feel comfortable around so many people. They had understood the directions correctly. On a street sign, they read the same name that was on their note, and at the far end of a narrow alley, they finally found a house with a matching number. An elderly woman was weeding the front garden. When she heard the clatter of horses' hooves, she looked up from her work, face beaming. Baba Boxberg and Tatjana Martin from Zendro Stud, she asked. Uh, Bibi Bloxberg, Bibi corrected her. And Tina Martin, Tina added. Irvendek, how do you do? shouted the woman warmly. My name is Elizabeth, or perhaps more simply for you, Elizabeth. She opened the garden gate and invited them in. On her property, she kept some chickens, a sheep, and even a cow. The stable behind the house was big enough to accommodate Tango and Masha. When the horses were taken care of and well housed in the stable, Elizabeth led Bibi and Tina into the house. A sofa bed was already prepared for them in the guest room. The girls unloaded their belongings and freshened up before joining Elizabeth at the old farmer's table in the living room. Andreas's sister came out of the kitchen carrying a large oven dish, steaming and sizzling with the irresistible, delicious scent of chasa morja, the Hungarian version of pancakes. Well, you too? Elizabeth asked. Surely you have not eaten properly. She could tell by the tips of their noses that they were hungry, and Bibi and Tina dug in straight away. Mmm, 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 oh my. This is delicious, Bibi munched with her mouth full. Despite her hunger, she hadn't forgotten the question that was most on her mind. She was eager to finally find out whether Mikosh had actually arrived in Hortobaji with the horse herders. After she had devoured a few bites, she asked Elizabeth about the Chicos. Andreas's sister hesitated with her answer. Well, children, she finally said. I have good news and bad news about that. Bibi was so frightened that the last bite got stuck in her throat. Tina also forgot to chew and stared expectantly at their hostess. Two days ago, a group of chicos did indeed arrive, Elizabeth continued. Among them was a boy of your age. A really handsome boy with dark curly hair. That sounds just like Mikos, right, Bibi? Tina said teasingly, but her friend was not in the mood for jokes. If that was the good news, what's the bad news? She asked. Elizabeth hesitated again. She sighed and said, The group has already ridden on, towards the east. It took a moment for Bibi to understand what that meant. East of Hortobaji lay the Pusta forest. Janusz had warned Bibi and Tina not to ride there under any circumstances. They had promised him to turn back if they didn't find Mikos in Hortobaji. As it looked now, there was nothing else they could do. They had to keep their promise and return to Zendro. In the east of the wild Pusta, Bibi had lost her appetite and pushed her plate away sullenly. Tina was no longer hungry either. I'm sorry you made the trip here for nothing, Elizabeth said sympathetically. Crestfallen, Bibi fixed her gaze on the tablecloth pattern before startling the others with a rocket-like launch out of her chair. No, we didn't, she cried. Elizabeth, when did the Chicos ride on? Early this morning, she answered, frowning suspiciously. Why do you want to know that? If they left early today, Bibi thought aloud, they can't have gone far. 
They are a large group and they have no destination. They're just wandering around in the pusta with their herd, right? Elizabeth didn't quite understand what Bibi was getting at, but Tina knew exactly what she was thinking. You want to ride after them? She asked. Even though Janusz has forbidden us? Bibi nodded, barely able to conceal the smile forming across her face. She was not ready to give up. Bibi knew that she and Tina could move faster than the group. With a bit of luck and unwavering determination, they would surely find Mikosh. We won't have to ride far into the forest, she offered, trying to ease Tina and Elizabeth's concerns. Surely it can't be dangerous for us there. Elizabeth weighed this over carefully. She was uncomfortable with the idea of letting the girls ride east alone. How will you find Mikosh? she said. The wood pusta is big. The chicos could be anywhere. That's easy, Bibi was convinced. We'll have someone with us who can track them. This someone was, of course, none other than Snowball, and he confirmed Bibi's words with a powerful bark. Elizabeth smiled. She knew only too well how important this was for the girls. They had ridden such a long way, only now to return empty-handed. Very well, she finally said. Go after him. Bibi was elated. Tina was also glad that they would continue the search for Mikosh, but Elizabeth only allowed the girls to go on one condition. They had three days. If they had not found them by then, they were to return to Hotobaji. Until then, Elizabeth would have to delay her brother Andreas and Janusz. She would call them today to tell them that Bibi and Tina had arrived safe and sound. If they asked about Mikosh, Elizabeth would tell them something that came closest to the truth that Mikosh was somewhere around here, but the girls had not yet found him. In the meantime, the sun had long set and the night sky was already speckled with stars. Bibi and Tina hadn't noticed how quickly the time had flown by. They helped Elizabeth to clear the table, wished her good night, and went to bed. Bibi and Tina woke up the next morning to the first rays of sunshine. Their hostess had been awake a while before them to feed the chickens and milk the cow. The two friends freshened up and helped her make breakfast. As they sat together at the handcrafted farmer's table, Elizabeth told them about yesterday's telephone conversation. Janos had been uncomfortable about the girls wanting to continue their search, but he hadn't forbidden them either, so this hurdle had already been cleared. Oh, Elizabeth, you're the very best, Tina rejoiced. But to the girls' astonishment, Andreas' sister remained very serious. She seemed to be worried about something and nervously brushed a few breadcrumbs together on the tabletop. Elizabeth? Bibi asked. Is something wrong? You'll probably think I've lost my marbles, she said. She reported that her brother had called early in the morning to warn Bibi and Tina that he had been awakened in the night by the call of an owl. You must know that these night birds announce the coming of misfortune, Elizabeth said, at least when they are on the roof of a house. Bibi and Tina nodded. Andreas had told them something similar when they arrived at the stud farm. Andreas got up, Elizabeth continued, and looked out the window. The moon shone brightly on the roofs of the stud farm, and that's when my brother discovered the bird. But of course he was sitting on a roof, Bibi thought. Where else? She tried to suppress a smile, which she could only do with difficulty. When she shot a secretive glance at Tina, her friend winked at her. Apparently, they were both thinking the same thing about this owl story. After a meaningful pause, Elizabeth continued in a voice teeming with doom. The owl was sitting on the roof of the stable, exactly on the spot above Baboshko's stall. Andreas was firmly convinced that Mikosh would not return to Zendrostud. Baboshko's stall would remain empty from now on. The horse, like Mikosh, would be resigned to an itinerant, aimless life in the wild pusta, never again to truly find a place to call home. An awkward silence hung over Elizabeth's living room, broken by Bibi's decisive headshake. No, she said resolutely. Whatever Andreas saw and heard, I do not believe the future is fixed. I agree with you, said Tina. Only when we have found Mikosh and talked to him will we know whether he wants to return to Zendra Stud or not. Elizabeth didn't seem quite convinced but she finally nodded. You're right. You shouldn't let this superstition turn you into a fool. It was soon time for Bibi and Tina to leave. After cleaning Masha and Tango thoroughly, they saddled their horses and loaded them with their supplies. 
Elizabeth accompanied them to the river, along which the Chicos had ridden further east. She led the two friends and their horses down the road, and soon they had reached the outskirts of Hortobaji. Snowball ran ahead of the group. When he reached the bank of the river, he seemed to have discovered something. He set into a barking frenzy and jumped up and down excitedly. As the girls and Elizabeth approached the spot, they recognized hoofprints in the marshy ground. Here, a group of riders had also followed the course of the river. Bibi took out Mikosh's pocket knife and held it under Snowball's nose. Find him, Snowball, she called out. Find Mikosh. The dog sniffed at the knife handle. With his muzzle just above the ground, Snowball set forth on a mission, pacing back and forth, retracing the whole area until rooting himself in one spot and announcing with a tremendous bark that he had finally caught the scent. Bibi and Tina embraced Elizabeth and bid her farewell before mounting their horses. See you in three days at the latest, Andreas's sister called after them. All the best, you two. Goodbye, Elizabeth, Bibi and Tina called back. Thanks for everything. Bibi and Tina followed the hoofprints throughout the morning. The Chicos had kept close to the shore, but around noon, the ground had turned to gravel, then rocks, until large boulders eventually blocked their path. The horse herders had not been able to ride on here either. Snowball had already sniffed out which direction they had taken. They had ridden out onto the plain, where they'd left a clear trail in the high pusta grass. Bibi and Tina rode on for another hour or so until they reached the foot of a hill. There, the Chicos had likely taken a rest and eaten lunch. Snowball ran barking around a place where, at the remains of a campfire, the grass was flattened and Mikos had apparently been sitting. Bibi took a seat very close by. While Tina lit a fire, Bibi looked longingly over to Mikos's seat. Not more than a day ago, he had sat there and talked to the Chicos, probably about the herd they were driving across the Pusta, possibly also about problems one of the horses had, and maybe also about which direction they should follow. Did he ever think about Bibi? Had he ever been lost in thought, like she was now, wondering what she was doing? And had he perhaps also overheard a question that one of the Chicos had asked him, just as Bibi now overheard the question that Tina had asked her? Bibi got up. What did you say? Nothing important, laughed Tina. Just whether to warm you up some of the pancakes that Elizabeth gave us. I'd love some, answered Bibi gratefully. Andreas's sister had stocked them with plenty of food. Pancakes from last night, cheese, hard-boiled eggs from her own chickens, peppers from her garden, home-baked bread, and a few portions of stew. Tina carefully sat down beside Bibi, holding two plates of delicious steaming pancakes. With a ravenous appetite, the girls devoured the food while Snowball gnawed on a calf's bone. It was not quite as hot as the days before. The weather report Elizabeth had heard on the radio that morning warned of a thunderstorm, but the clouds moving across the sky were not the type for rain. Perhaps, at least the girls hoped so, the storm had passed them by. Bibi and Tina hadn't met a soul since they left Hortobaji. They were so relaxed being all alone that they both jumped in alarm when a voice bellowed over the tall grass. Hey, hey, hey! Someone shouted. It sounded a lot like Mikosh when he would cheer for Baboshko. Bibi's heart suddenly raced. It wasn't Mikosh, and she knew it. His voice sounded completely different. But maybe it was one of the Chicos? Perhaps they were there on the other side of the hill. Didn't she hear the thunder of hooves? And the snorting and neighing of horses? Something was strange. Bibi thought she heard the sound of an engine, and certainly none of the Chicos had a car. She looked at her friend Tina, who had heard the shouting as well. Snowball perked up his ears, and when the girls jumped up and ran up the hill, he left his bone and ran after them. Bibi and Tina fell speechless when they looked out over the hill. On the other side stretched the vast plain of the Pusta over which they could see a herd of wild horses galloping. A car chased after them, a bright green jeep. Three men sat in it. One of them, a wiry guy in a jogging suit, was leaning far out the window, twirling a lasso in his hand and shouting, Hey, hey, hey! Bibi and Tina looked at each other in shock. There was no doubt that the three men were Steve, Carl, and Johnny, and they were hunting wild horses. The Storm 
Snowball gritted his teeth as the hairs on the back of his neck bristled. He growled at the distant jeep racing across the pusta. Bibi and Tina watched in horror as the car came ever closer to a wild foal. Johnny had already lassoed it while the foal neighed in panic. His mother ran close beside him and tried to shield her little one from the danger, but Steve swerved the jeep between the two horses and pushed them apart. Now, Johnny, he commanded. Bibi and Tina were paralyzed with fear and bewilderment as they witnessed the terrible chase. You have to do something, Bibi, Tina rebelled in rage. Yes, thought Bibi, I will. She thrust out her hands and shouted, Eeny meeny horse's mouth, release the foal and lasso yourself, whiz whiz. Little sparkling stars whirled around Bibi's fingers with a pling pling sound and flashed over the pusta to the green jeep. Johnny had just thrown the lasso and the noose was almost around the little foal's neck when the rope suddenly snapped back. It spiraled for a brief moment high up in the air before shooting back down and winding itself over and over around Johnny. Until from the girl's vantage point, he looked like a human hot dog. Harry, what the heck is... He shouted before the rope tied him so tightly from head to toe that he could no longer make a sound. Steve looked at his buddy in utter amazement and slammed on the brakes so abruptly that the big package which was now a lassoed up Johnny slowly tipped over and fell out of the jeep with a thud. The little foal was already far away with his mother and the rest of the herd. Steve and Carl stared after the cloud of dust in which the wild horses had galloped away. Their gaze wandered back to Johnny, who lay tied up on the ground behind them. They jumped out of the car and hurried to his side, the girls cheered. Bibi had done it. The little foal was saved. That'll teach them a lesson, said Tina. But let's get out of here. I've had enough of those guys. Bibi had to agree with her friend. She too wanted to avoid any further confrontations with them. The two girls quickly packed their things together, put out the campfire, and climbed into the saddles. Snowball picked up the pace again and ran in front of Bibi and Tina. The trail of the Chicos led in an arc around the hill and then straight across the plain, far away from the jeep with the three poachers. In the meantime, dark clouds had appeared in the sky. Unfortunately, the weather forecast seemed to be right. In the distance, Bibi and Tina spotted remote showers of rain falling on the pusta. The wind was gathering momentum, with an occasional sharp gust whistling around the girls' ears. Scattered trees appeared on the horizon gnarled old oaks that the wind had shaped over many years. When Bibi and Tina reached them, they saw that more trees followed behind, standing ever closer together, leading them into the middle of a dark forest. So there they were, in the Eros Pusta, the wild forest Pusta, and they still hadn't caught up with Mikosh. The rain began to fall heavily. The horse herders had followed a narrow path, maybe a path where the Chicos had been driving their herds for centuries. Bibi saw nothing but lush, dark green everywhere about her. Mosses and lichens entwined themselves around the trunks of the trees. From the branches, creepers hung down to the forest floor, and in the undergrowth, giant, fallen trees decayed in the impenetrable thicket. At last the forest thinned out, revealing a canyon lined with jagged rocks. A small river meandered through the middle, the wind had still not subsided, but had also broken the cloud cover overhead, offering the girls a clear view of the low-setting sun as it bathed the rocks in red twilight. Bibi and Tina had not even noticed how late it was. They searched for a place to camp for the night and pitched their tent beneath a few large rocks, well protected from the wind and rain. The horses also had a safe place nearby. The friends warmed up a portion of Elizabeth's stew on a gas burner. But as soon as they had finished eating, all they wanted was to climb into their tent. After wishing Tango and Masha good night, they quickly crawled into their sleeping bags. The night became one long bad dream. Strong gusts of wind whistled forcefully through the valley, howling around the rocks and shaking the tent walls. Snowball, who had always lain outside as a faithful watchdog, fled under the canopy. He whimpered so heartbreakingly that Tina finally brought him inside. After midnight, the rain set in again, and this time it wasn't only brief showers. Torrents poured down in full force onto the roof, and Bibi and Tina were awakened again and again by the loud clapping and crackling of the rain. 
To make matters worse, the wind had changed direction and their camp was no longer protected by the rocks. Blasts of wind made the tent poles creak and push the roof down so far that it hung just above the two girls' nose tips. To their dismay, the tent was not as weatherproof as Andreas had thought when he had given it to them. In the early morning, Bibi noticed that her feet were wet. She reached for her flashlight and saw in the light beam how thin trickles of rainwater had made their way through the tent. Tina had not been spared either. As she rolled restlessly back and forth, she slipped off her mattress and splashed face down in a puddle of water. Ugh, she squeaked, pulling herself up. Her wristwatch showed just after six. She saw that Bibi was already awake and petting Snowball, who had snuggled up close. Let's pull down the tent and dry ourselves in the wind, Tina suggested. But we'll get soaking wet outside, Bibi interjected. Whether we get soaking wet inside or outside doesn't matter anymore, Tina replied. But if we stay here, we'll get blown away with the whole tent. Packing the saddlebags took longer than usual. Snowball jumped around excitedly in the girl's way, and the fluttering of the tent walls began to eat at their nerves. It was an unpleasant thought to have to venture out into this storm, but they had no choice. A new squall pressed the roof down again and slammed the tent pole against Bibi's head. To their horror, the girls heard one of the ropes that anchored the tent to the ground tear outside. Quick, Bibi, cried Tina against the rattling of the tent walls. This is an absolute emergency. You have to save the tent. Bibi did not hesitate for a moment. While the girls were still rushing out into the storm with their bags through the tent entrance, Bibi had already stretched out her hands and called out, Eeny meeny cotton rags, pack the tent in saddle bags, whiz whiz. With a ping ping, the witch's stars lit up brightly. They whizzed from Bibi's fingers to the tent and at once all the pegs flew up and out of the ground. The tent canvas inflated in the wind and spread out for just a moment, then folded up into a handy package in seconds before disappearing with the poles and pegs into the saddlebags. While Tina ran around the rock with the luggage, Bibi took care of the horses. Tango and Masha whinnied nervously. They had pressed themselves close to the rock face where they had been spared the worst of the bad weather, but the lashing rain and the noise of the wind frightened them. Bibi had to calm them well before they let her lead them away. Only when they were all together on the other side of the rock in safety could the two girls breathe a sigh of relief. The rain fell diagonally from behind in the strong wind, allowing them to navigate with only somewhat less difficulty. Exhausted, Bibi and Tina let themselves fall to the ground. They were dog-tired and soaked to the skin. For a while, they didn't speak a word. They knew they had to turn back as soon as the storm had passed. They didn't know what the weather would be like in the next few days, but they couldn't take the risk of getting caught in such a storm again. They could be glad that nothing worse had happened to them, that they had only gotten wet and hadn't been able to sleep. How easily Tango and Masha could have panicked. Then they would now be sitting there without their horses, in the middle of the forest pusta. The two friends knew what it meant if they stopped the search they would probably not get a second chance to look for Mikosh. Even if Janusz gave them another three days, before they reached this valley again, the Chicos would be long gone. Bibi tried in vain to suppress a sob. Farewell, Mikosh, she thought. I will never see you again. Help for the Chicos Bibi could no longer hold back the tears. She shivered all over from the cold and fatigue. She pulled her legs up and wrapped her arms around her knees. But that didn't help much. Only when Tina took her friend in her arms did it get a little better. They remained motionless together. Bibi had her eyes closed. Above her, the wind howled with unbridled strength. The rain whipped across the pusta grass, and at the edge of the forest, the tops of the trees bowed in every direction. Bibi didn't know how long they had been sitting there like that. She had lost all sense of time. If only the storm would stop, she thought. While the two girls held each other close, a miracle occurred. The first thing Bibi felt was warmth on her skin. Where did it come from? Had the sun appeared for a moment? She blinked and opened her eyes. All around her it sparkled and glittered. Raindrops flashed on the stalks of pusta grass in the glistening light of the morning sun. Tina, cried Bibi 
unable to believe her own eyes. The sun is shining. Now Tina looked around too. She held her hand in front of her eyes to shield them from the blinding light. The heavy dark storm clouds had moved further west. Above Bibi and Tina was nothing but the blue summer sky and a shimmering rainbow, arched from one end of the valley to the other. But what took Bibi's breath away was a sight she had never expected. Horses were grazing by the narrow river, not far from the rock where the girls had set up camp. It was not a wild herd, but one guided by men in dark blue garments who appeared to be leading them. In the midst of the group, she discovered someone who made her heart stand still. It can't be, she thought. He can't be here. So close, and we didn't even notice him? No, it was impossible. She had to be mistaken. That boy with the dark curly hair over there couldn't be the one she thought he was. But when Snowball jumped up barking joyfully and ran to him, there was no doubt about it. It was Mikush. Tina, da, 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 Bibi stammered. Yes, laughed Tina. I saw him too. Go say hello to him. Bibi was unstoppable. She shot up and ran through the rain-soaked grass down to the river. Snowball had reached Mikosh by now and was jumping on him. Snowball! Mikosh was completely amazed. What are you doing here? Did you follow me all the way here? When he looked up and saw who else came running across the meadow, his mouth dropped open in disbelief. He stared at Bibi awestruck. He ran the last steps toward her, took her in his arms, and whirled her around in a circle. Unbelievable, he shouted. Bibi, is it really you? Hey, I'm getting dizzy, Bibi laughed. Mikosh put her down again, but held her in his arms for a while longer. Bibi felt as if all the disappointments, efforts, and horrors of the last few days were falling away from her as Mikosh whispered something into her ear. I couldn't stop thinking of you, Bibi. I missed you so much. A little while later, Bibi, Tina, and Mikosh sat together on the meadow in the warm morning sun for breakfast. The Chico's camp was not far from where the two girls had pitched their tent. The horse herders had also sought shelter from the storm in the lee of some rocks, and that was why Bibi and Tina had not seen their tents last night. Snowball lay happily in the grass at the feet of the three friends. He had wolfed down a huge portion of the dog food they had brought with them and then curled up, full and satisfied. Tango, Masha, and Baboshko grazed close by near the riverbank. The horse herders, who had greeted Bibi and Tina warmly, knew that the friends now had a lot to tell each other and did not want to disturb them, so they retreated to their camp. Mikosh was surprised that Alex was not with them, so Bibi and Tina told them what had happened. Mikosh learned that Tina's boyfriend had a similar problem to his own, even though Alex couldn't run away from his father. Bibi remembered Janosch's message for Mikosh. When Mikosh heard that Janosch was ready to talk about everything, he nodded but said nothing more about it. He first wanted to hear what Bibi and Tina had been through since their departure from Falkenstein. They told him about the train journey, about their arrival at the stud farm and all those good and bad signs that Andreas wanted to see. Bibi took out of her saddlebag the one good sign that Snowball had discovered on the first day of their ride to Hordobaji. Here, this is yours. Mikosh beamed when he saw his pocket knife in Bibi's hand. Amazing, he shouted. I can't believe you found it. Without a knife, he told the girls, a horse herder was lost in the wilderness. He thanked Bibi, Tina, and Snowball, and after carefully putting the knife away, the two friends continued their story. Then Mikosh told them how he was doing. He apologized for not having sent a message to the girls, but in the pusta there was neither mail nor a telephone connection. From Hordobaji, he had wanted to write a letter to Bibi and Tina and send it to the stud farm, but because the Chicos had left very early in the morning, this simply wasn't possible. By that time, we had long since left the stud farm, Bibi said, and now you've told us everything anyway, a bit late, but still. No, I haven't told you everything. Mikos suddenly became very serious. In Hungarian, he shouted something to the horse herders, and three of the men came over to them. They were in their early twenties and spent most of their time in the fresh air, on horseback. Their faces were sunburnt, and they had the athletic build of skilled riders. They wore the typical outfit of the horse herders, as Mikosh explained to the girls. Dark blue, baggy trousers, a coat made of a light blue fabric with golden buttons, and a wide hat with a curved feather. 
The three sat down with them and introduced themselves. The oldest of them was called Bela. He was the leader of the group of Chicos that Mikos had joined. The second of the herders was Bela's brother, Jasper, and the third was called Jano. He led another group that had wanted to meet Bela here in the valley. But last night, a few hours before the great storm, something terrible had happened. Jano had not wanted to take the path through the forest, but rather to enter the valley from the north over a hilltop. Before they reached the hill, a group of policemen in an off-road vehicle had approached them and told them to stop. They had treated the Chicos like criminals, claiming that that was exactly what the herders were. They took you for criminals? Tina asked, taken aback. What did they say to you? They claimed we were poachers, replied Jano. Miko snorted, outraged. The Chicos, of all people, no one loves nature as much as they do. Yes, but we get blamed for all sorts of things again and again, Bela said. If there's a break-in somewhere, we are the ones to blame. Or if a cow has disappeared from a pasture somewhere, it means we stole it. Bibi and Tina remembered what they had heard about the Chicos. Above all, they remembered how Janos had complained about them. It's simply because of how we Chicos live, Jaspar explained to them. We have no fixed abode and lead a completely free life in the Pusta. That scares a lot of people. But what are you being accused of this time? Tina asked. Jano reported that, for a few days now, wild horses had been disappearing in this area. Not horses from the herds that the Chicos were herding, but animals living in the wild. Vacationers had allegedly seen two Chicos capture wild horses and lead them away, probably to sell them to horse breeders for a lot of money. The description that the vacationers had given of the Chicos applied to two men from Jano's group, and these two were arrested and taken away by the police. I know those two, Jano affirmed. They would never do such a thing. Besides, they have been with us all the time. There's no way they could be the poachers. Mikosh was also firmly convinced of that. He wanted to help Jano and the others to prove the two Chicos were innocent. With Bibi and Tina's help, it would be even easier, he said. Bela, Jaspar, and Jano looked at the two girls questioningly. How could they help them? They are both great riders, Mikosh said. And besides, Bibi is no ordinary girl. Mikosh explained to the three horse herders that Bibi was a witch and had often rescued them from dangerous situations. Is that true? Bela asked excitedly. You are a witch? Does that mean you can just make the missing wild horses reappear? But Bibi had to disappoint him. The problem could not be solved so easily, because she had to know where the horses were. But we will help you prove your friend's innocence without magic, she promised. She already had an idea. First, we should look for clues, she suggested. Do you know where the wild horses have disappeared to? asked Tina. Jano nodded. According to the vacationer's account, the Chicos had captured them in the plain at the northern edge of the forest, not far from the place where the two horse herders had been arrested. Let's have a look there, Bibi suggested. I'm sure we'll find something. Mikosh was also quite confident that the search would be successful. You'll see, Jano, he said. With the help of Bibi and Tina, we'll find the real poachers. Your friends will soon be free again. On the Poacher's Tale They left shortly after. Jano rode ahead, followed by Bela and Jaspar. Behind them, Bibi rode Tango and Tina Masha. Mikosh brought up the rear on Maboshko, with Snowball running at his side. Like a good herding dog, he would run to the front every now and then to make sure that everything was all right. The group kept close to the edge of the forest and followed the small river on the left bank. At a shallow spot, the riders crossed the riverbed and rode onwards to a narrow path that curved up the mountain. From the top of the hill, they had a wide view in all directions. The valley stretched out to the south, and eventually merged into the plain of the Pusta. To the west lay the dark green impenetrable canopy of leaves topping the forest that Bibi and Tina had crossed. On the other side of the hill was a valley, into which they rode after a short rest. The riders soon reached the edge of the forest. Jano stopped at the place where the two Chicos had been arrested. He explained to the others that the policeman's car had come over from the valley. Afterwards, they had traveled north with the two horse herders, where the nearest police station was located in a small village. The ground of the Pusta was damp after the rain, and puddles had formed miniature lakes across the lower-lying areas. 
Bibi and Tina clearly recognized the tire prints of an off-road vehicle in the scattered patches of mud. But that was the only trace they could find. The group decided to ride along the edge of the forest and look for additional prints on the ground. Without warning, Snowball started barking. He had come across a herd of wild horses grazing not far away at the edge of the forest. The horses lifted their heads anxiously and looked around. A strong brown stallion threw his neck up into the air and whinnied. He was clearly the leader, signaling the others that danger was near. At once, the whole herd broke into a canter and fled with thundering hooves out onto the pusta. For some reason, the animals are nervous, said Jaspar. When I think of the jeep with the men we saw out here yesterday, they have every reason to be, Bibi said. Jano heard this remark and wanted to know everything about these men in the jeep. He gave Bibi and Tina his undivided attention, concentrating on every word when they described Steve, Carl, and Johnny in more detail. His face darkened. We've met those guys before, he said. They weren't hunting wild horses, but they were racing way too fast through the pusta. Jano and the other chicos had approached the men. They had told them that the pusta was not a racetrack, but the men had only laughed and even been insulted. Yes, now it all makes sense, Bibi said thoughtfully. Didn't you wonder who those vacationers were who described the two chicos so precisely to the police? A light suddenly went on for Jano. Only Steve, Carl, and Johnny could have been the ones who told the police. Not only had they taken revenge on the Chicos, but if they were the poachers, then the men had successfully diverted all the attention from themselves. Unfortunately, no one could prove it. Speak of the devil, Jaspar murmured, his focus fixed at a small point on the horizon, which was moving at high speed towards the group of riders. That's the jeep, Tina cried out. Come on! Let's get them, shouted Bela as he dashed off on his horse. Bibi, Tina, and Mikosh and the other riders followed him at a wild gallop. At Jano's signal, they fanned out and rode in a line next to each other. This must have been a frightening sight for the three men, as the imposing riders left no doubt that their goal was the car in front of them, and that they were determined to intercept it. At full speed ahead, the group reached the jeep and circled around the vehicle. Steve did not even try to turn the car around. He stared at the riders with his mouth agape and slowed the car to a stop. Snowball had not been able to keep up with the rapid pace of the riders, but quickly joined them in the catch, growling and flashing his teeth around the car. So we meet again, called Jano, firing an angry look at the men in the jeep. Carl and Johnny turned pale with disbelief, but Steve recovered after a short moment and pretended to look confused. Have we met before? He asked casually. We had the pleasure the other day, Jano said coolly. Shortly after that, you made two of my people look guilty in front of the police for something they did not do. Steve just shrugged his massive shoulders. I have no idea what you are talking about. Do you, Carl? Johnny? Nope, Carl just muttered, and Johnny shook his head. Then you probably don't remember chasing a little filly yesterday either, Bibi intervened. That caught the three of them completely off guard. How do you know about that? Carl snapped before getting a strong elbow knock from Steve. Steve, who had looked at the other two girls with a frown, gradually began to see how he knew them. Ah, oh, no, he remarked. Ginger and Blondie from the train. How nice to meet again out here in beautiful nature. At this remark, Miko snorted contemptuously. Beautiful nature? As if you even cared. Please, please, protested Steve, making an exaggeratedly hurt face. Don't be so judgmental. We would never say that the Chicos are prowlers and thieves, right, Carl? Johnny? No way. Only yesterday when we went to the police, Carl babbled mindlessly, but was rudely interrupted by Johnny immediately afterwards. We're peaceful, nature-loving travelers, he smiled, searching for his buddy Steve's approval with a poorly attempted angel face. Exactly, Steve affirmed. And now that we've cleared that up, I'd like to ask you to clear the way. How dare he even try to talk his way out of this, Tina whispered sneeringly into the ear of her friend Bibi. Jano realized that he could do nothing more. He glared resentfully once more at Steve and then rode aside. With only the slightest pressure from their thighs, Bela and Jaspar also ordered their horses to walk as the group of riders slowly started moving again. Bibi was the last in line she suddenly noticed that her left stirrup had loosened during the wild gallop. 
she stopped and bent to the side to strap it on. Johnny, Steve, and Carl didn't seem to notice that she was still nearby. As the jeep began rolling, B.B. picked up a few more exchanges between the men. We'd better move our nightly activities down to the valley, said Johnny. Another nighttime thing like that again, Carl moaned. But first we're going to get some sleep. Sure, Carl, said Steve and stepped on the gas, so B.B. couldn't understand a word. But what she had heard was enough. She hurried to catch up with the others and quickly told them what she had overheard. Everyone agreed that the three men in the green jeep could only have meant the hunting of wild horses when they had said, nightly activities. With police patrols and horse herders wandering through the pusta, poaching in broad daylight seemed to have become too dangerous for them. They must have been talking about the valley where we saw the other herd earlier, Mikos thought aloud. The friends decided to lie in wait around the valley basin at night. They'll get the biggest surprise of their lives, cried Bibi. If those guys are hunting wild horses again, we'll catch them in the act. Escaped. The horsemen returned to the camp and told the other chicos what they had learned. They ate an early supper together and discussed how they would catch the poachers during the night. Almost all the horse herders would be present. Only Jaspar would stay at the camp and guard the herd. They would take up their positions around the valley, and as soon as the men appeared in the jeep to commence their hunt, the group would surround them so that Steve, Carl, and Johnny could no longer deny their misdeeds. When they set off, Jano again led the group. Bibi, Tina, and Mikosh would lie in wait below the hilltop. Bela would ride further east and stay on their side of the valley basin, while all the others would cross the valley and spread out over the group of hills on the other side. Mikosh discovered a hollow that served as an excellent hiding place. From the edge of the hollow, the three friends watched the other riders. Bela could no longer be seen. The other chicos had reached the bottom of the valley by now and had ridden past a herd of wild horses grazing peacefully at the southern edge. When they noticed the strangers, they whinnied nervously but quickly calmed down again. The valley fell silent as the sun set. The friends still saw a purple stripe of light on the horizon. Then it was pitch black. Only when the moon rose behind one of the hills could the three friends see something down in the valley again. The herd of wild horses had moved a little further west, but the men in the jeep were nowhere to be seen. Those three guys are taking their time, Tina thought. One look at the luminous numbers on her wristwatch showed her that it was already approaching midnight. Hour after hour went by, but the jeep never showed up. The three friends wondered whether Steve, Carl, and Johnny had changed their minds. Or had they postponed their trip for another night? Snowball sprang up, breaking the quiet of their thoughts. He raised his head, perked up his ears, and listened. A howling sound rang from over the hill behind them. Is that a wolf? Tina asked, worriedly. Mikosh calmed her down. He had often heard wolves howling before, but this one sounded different. More like a human imitating a wolf. Still, he had trouble keeping Snowball quiet who wanted to answer the canine call. Footsteps and the clatter of hooves approached. A man appeared at the edge of the hollow. In the bright light of the moon, the three friends recognized Bela, who had dismounted and was now leading his horse by the reins. Did you hear the howling? He asked softly. That was Jaspar. He wants to tell us that there's danger. Down at camp. The three friends were alarmed. Danger in the camp? What could that be? Bela suspected that it was not wild animals, but people that Jaspar was warning about. And was it not obvious that they were the ones who'd been making trouble in the area the last few days? You mean it's Steve, Carl, and Johnny? Mikosh asked. Of course, Bibi stepped in. That's why they didn't show up here. By valley, they didn't mean here, but the neighboring valley. Mikosh suggested they ride back to camp with Bibi and Tina immediately. Bela should inform the other chicos and follow the three friends as soon as possible. The three rode out of the hollow and further up to the top of the hill. Snowball ran ahead and led them to the path that wound down into the valley on the other side. Bibi, Tina, and Mikosh kept a close watch for the poachers. Something seemed to be going on at the end of the valley. The sound of thundering hooves carried through the wind. They slowed their horses to a trot when they reached the foot of the ridge. From here, they saw the cluster of rocks where the camp was located. Jaspar came running towards them excitedly. At last, you're here, he shouted. They're over there, the men with the jeep. 
They're hunting wild horses. He pointed down the valley towards the silhouettes of the majestic animals. The horses stormed closer and the ground vibrated under their hooves. The roar grew louder and louder. It was a whole herd of them, whinnying in panic and fleeing up the valley, directly toward the Chicos' camp. Tango and Masha scraped their hooves restlessly while Boboshko tensed and neighed, infected by the fear of the wild herd. The three friends struggled to keep their horses calm as the wild animals charged closer to the camp. Snowball whimpered and tucked his tail. Masha took a few steps back as Tango began to rear. Mikosh had leaned far forward and whispered reassuring words into the trembling Baboshko's ear. Only when the herd had raced by did the horses relax again. The friends could still see the wild horses galloping through the river and disappearing into the distance. Bibi, Tina, and Mikosh peered in the direction from which the herd had come. Two red lights flashed at the end of the valley, the taillights of a jeep. Not only could they hear the hum of the engine, but also the desperate neighing of a horse. They've got one of the wild horses, cried Tina in horror. They had to race after it. Maybe they could still manage to catch up with the jeep. If they rode at full gallop, they might have been faster than the car, but also faster than Snowball, and they didn't want to do this without his help under any circumstances. He could help them with his amazing nose in case they lost the trail. Mikosh jumped off Baboshko's back. Snowball seemed to know what he was up to and looked at him with his big doggy eyes. I know you don't like it, but unfortunately, it's got to be done, Miko said apologetically. He lifted Snowball, got a running start, and before the dog knew it, he was sitting on the horse's back in front of Mikosh. Go, Baboshko, cried Mikosh. The girls gave a light kick of the heels, bringing Tango and Masha to a trot. Good luck, cried Jaspar after them. The friends dashed across the step at full gallop. Straight as an arrow, they headed for the taillights that flashed before them on the pusta grass. But no matter how fast they rode, the green jeep seemed to keep its distance. Baboshko, run! Mikos cheered his stallion. He held the reins only loosely with one hand, as Baboshko knew his rider well and reacted to even the slightest command. With the other hand, Mikos gripped Snowball tightly. At first, the dog kept his head tucked low between his paws. His courage steadily grew, however, and went from barely peeking over Mikos's arm to finally shoving his muzzle into the wind tongue flapping wildly. The strip of light on the east side of the valley had become brighter. The moon had faded from the morning sky, but it would take a while before the sun had risen over the hills. The landscape still lay in twilight. All of a sudden, the three friends noticed that they could barely make out the headlights. Mist rose from the dewy grass and sheets of fog rolled in from over by the small river. Visibility became increasingly poor. The friends saw the red lights flashing one last time, before the fog swallowed any trace. We have to ride more slowly, cried Mikosh. But we'll lose the jeep, Bibi interjected. It was no use. It was far too dangerous to gallop in this fog. Bibi could barely even see the others. They had no idea if they were still heading in the right direction, and they hadn't seen the jeep for quite a while. They stayed close together so as not to lose sight, eventually slowing their trot to a walk. By now, the fog was so thick that they couldn't even see the grass under the horse's hooves. It's enough to drive you mad, cursed Tina. Maybe the jeep's already gone in another direction and we're riding further and further away from it. The three friends stopped, hoping to hear the engine of the jeep, but the only sound remaining was the soft ripple of the little river. It's no use anymore, sighed Mikosh. They got away from us. The Poacher's Hideout No, protested Bibi vehemently. We won't give up that easily. Tina and Mikosh turned to her, confused. Before they could even ask what she was up to, Bibi held out her hands and shouted, Eeny, meeny, stallion's gate, tire tracks illuminate, whiz, whiz. With a ping, ping, sparkling stars circled around Bibi's fingers and whizzed out into the mist. That won't help, Tina remarked disappointedly. Have you cast a spell on yourself, Bibi? At first, the spell didn't seem to have worked, as no one noticed any change in their current predicament. But suddenly, Mikosh pointed to a spot behind Bibi and Tina. There! I think I see something, he cried. Behind the two girls, a low light began to illuminate the fog. The three riders turned their horses around and approached carefully as it grew brighter and stronger with every step. In the tall grass, 
The Jeep's tire tracks lit up like glowing puddles thanks to Bibi's spell. Now it was easy to follow the trail. Bibi, Tina, and Mikosh could only move slowly in the thick fog, but they were sure to be on the right path. After a short while, the mist had cleared even more. The sun had risen in the meantime, and the three friends were more than grateful to feel its warmth on their skin. For most of the journey, they had been riding in a southerly direction. Now, the trail bent into a wide arc towards the west. The fog had continued to rise, and through patches in its overlay, the riders could see thick, mossy tree trunks off to their right side. As the grass beneath them more thin and the ground more rugged with rocks, the glowing tire tracks became more and more difficult to see. Until, finally, they disappeared completely. Only a few splashes of light remained on the stony earth before the three riders realized that they had lost the tracks for good. This time, Snowball came to their aid. Bibi, Tina, and Mikosh had just stopped their horses when the dog raised his head, jumped off Baboshka's back, and ran over to the edge of the forest. Barking wildly, he paced up and down in front of a bush, and when the friends followed him, they saw that, behind its solid green cover, a narrow path led into the forest. Snowball was unstoppable as he took off down the small trail. At a trot, the friends rode after him. The fog had also cleared in the forest, but only a few rays of sunlight could penetrate through the dense canopy of leaves. Again and again, Bibi, Tina, and Mikosh had to duck in front of the low-hanging branches and creepers to keep Snowball in sight. Thorny bushes lined the roadside, and the three wondered where he was leading them. Suddenly, the dog stopped. His neck fur was ruffled, and he growled from the deepest depths of his throat. Between the thick tree trunks, they saw a clearing where a log cabin stood. Bibi held her breath as she spotted the green jeep parked in front of the entrance. Next to the hut was a small paddock. Some wild horses were standing there crowded together and whinnying miserably while Steve, Carl, and Johnny were about to lead in another horse. The mare resisted with all her strength, but the three men pulled and tugged at the lasso, whose noose had been tightly wound around the neck of the wild horse. Bibi, Tina, and Mikosh carefully dismounted, took their horses by the reins, and crept closer to the cabin. Tango, Masha, and Baboshko were nervous, and when Steve, Carl, and Johnny now drove the captured mare into the paddock with a whip and raw blows from a baton, they could barely contain their own urge to neigh loudly. Take it easy, the friends whispered to their horses. They were now so close that they could hear the three men. Hiding behind a bush, they saw Steve slam the paddock gate with a, There we are! It's really cool that we found a buyer for the horses, Carl said, grinning nastily. Then we'll have enough dough again for a trip even further east, laughed Johnny. At that moment, Bibi could no longer hold on to herself. It won't work anymore, she cried angrily and came out of hiding with Tango. Tina had walked around the bushes with Mikosh and the horses and gave the three men an angry look. So we caught you, you dirty poachers! The men were taken completely by surprise. Johnny had his eyes wide open. He puffed up his cheeks in amazement, looking very much like the toad Bibi had nearly turned him into on the train ride. Carl's jaw hung open, locked in disbelief, while Steve's face turned a bright candy red. He was the first to find his words again. So, did you catch us? I don't see how a pusta boy and two girls can possibly stop us. He gave his two pals a nod to follow him to the jeep. But Carl and Johnny were still so flabbergasted that Steve had to give them both two good blows with his elbow. Come on, let's get out of here, he drove at them. And only then did they stumble hastily towards the car. Bibi reacted with lightning speed. The three of them simply could not be allowed to escape. Eeny meeny poacher fat, blow the rubber tires flat, whiz whiz, she shouted. No sooner had she uttered the words than the blinking resounded and sparkling little witch stars rushed over to the car. With a tremendous bang, all four tires burst at the same time. Steve had already opened the driver's door while Carl and Johnny had run around the back of the car. At the sound of the blast, however, the men froze in place, stupefied, staring in disbelief at the flattened tires until Carl lost his footing and fell head first into the mud below the jeep. If that wasn't enough, the three hunters were in for an even bigger shock. 
Bibi, Tina, and Mikosh could also hardly believe what was happening. A muffled rumble echoed through the forest, and the ground trembled under their feet. Wearing wide-brimmed hats and dark blue uniforms, a group of riders came storming up on horseback. It was the Chicos. All those whom Bibi, Tina, and Mikosh had lain in wait with in the valley had arrived. Jaino was ahead of them. In a massive cloud of dust, they galloped to the small clearing in front of the cabin and lined themselves up threateningly in front of the three poachers. At that moment, Steve, Carl, and Johnny finally gave up. After the Chicos had arrived, Steve, Carl, and Johnny made no more attempts to escape. Jano had galloped to the next police station, and the other Chicos, Bibi, Tina, and Mikosh, had guarded the three men until Jano had returned with the police. The wild horses in the paddock had been proof enough, and Steve, Carl, and Johnny now had a lot of explaining to do. Together with the Chicos, Bibi, Tina, and Mikosh brought the wild horses back to their herds, where they were welcomed with happy neighing and prancing. The two horse herders, who had been arrested by the police only days before, were released with sincerest apologies. At last, they had arrived in the valley and joined the others in the cozy warmth of the campfire. Now tell me, Mikosh impatiently urged Bela. I don't think Bela has to explain it at all, said Tina. I know how the Chicos found us. Really? Bibi wondered. How did they find us? You of all people should ask that, cried her friend laughing. You brought them to us. Bibi didn't understand. How so? I still don't get it. Mikosh suddenly jumped up. Of course! The Chicos followed the tracks that Bibi had lit up. Bela recounted how Jaspar had told the others in the camp that Bibi, Tina, and Mikosh had followed the poachers. The Chicos had followed them, but without the glowing tracks, they would certainly have never found them. When the tire prints had disappeared into the rocky ground, Jano had remembered a nearby cabin in the forest which was occasionally rented to vacationers, and they had ridden there on a hunch. So once again, everything had turned out for the best. Almost everything, muttered Bibi as Bela finished his story above the crackling of the campfire. Only almost? Mikosh asked. What still got you down? Bibi looked at him quietly, and now he understood what she was getting at. You want to know if I'm going back to Zendro? Bibi nodded. The next morning, she and Tina would ride back to Elizabeth and Hortobaji as promised. But would Bibi's friend be there too? Mikosh sighed. To be honest, I haven't decided yet whether I want to go back. But one thing is clear. Whatever I decide, Bela, Jasper, and I will accompany you to Zendro Stud. Then I'll have a few days to think it over. Mikosh's Decision Bibi, Tina, and Mikosh had an early morning breakfast with the Chicos and then packed their things. Jano said goodbye to the two girls. He thanked them for their help. Without them, they would probably not have been able to prove the innocence of the two horse herders so quickly. When the three friends left together with Bela and Jaspar, the Chicos waved at them for a long time until they reached the narrow path that led through the forest. The sun was already high in the sky when the riders reached the plain on the other side. It seemed ages ago that right at this same spot, Bibi had saved the foal from the three poachers. They reached Hortobaji in the early evening. Elizabeth was beaming when the riders arrived. She took Bibi and Tina in her arms and greeted Mikosh, Bela, and Jaspar with heartfelt kindness. Elizabeth's house was too small to accommodate so many visitors, but the Chicos assured her that they preferred to sleep outside anyway. They camped in the garden together with Mikosh, while Bibi and Tina moved back into the guest room. For dinner, they all gathered around the big farmer's table, where Elizabeth surprised them with a sumptuous welcome meal. When everyone had had enough, Elizabeth thought it was high time to call Zendro Stud, and Mikosh wanted to be the first to do it. Elizabeth's telephone was in the hall, and although Bibi perked up her ears, straining to listen, Mikosh spoke too softly for her to hear anything. Bibi wouldn't have understood anyway because they were speaking Hungarian. When Mikos returned to the table, he looked contemplative. Bibi was bursting with curiosity and wanted to know what he had talked about with Janos. She followed Mikos out into the garden, where they sat down on a bench under an apple tree. At first, Mikos didn't want to say anything, but Bibi wouldn't let up, and finally, he told her that the conversation had been surprisingly peaceful. Mikos had feared that Janos would scold him because he had run away. Instead, 
he had remained calm and had asked Mikosh to return home. Janosch had given up the idea of sending him to Budapest, but he still insisted that Mikosh should get a proper education. That's also quite reasonable, Bibi encouraged. But Mikosh shook his head irritably. No one understands me. When I see Bela and Jaspar, I see a free life out on the Pusta. It makes me want nothing else but to ride off on Babashko. Bibi understood this very well, but realized that further words could do nothing. The decision Mikosh was about to make, he had to make all by himself. In her farewell the next morning, Andreas's sister took Bibi in her arms for a long time and whispered to her that everything would surely be all right. Mikos was still reserved and thoughtful. He rode last in the group and even fell back several times, which Snowball did not tolerate. He barked loudly each time until the boy had caught up with the others. When they came to the abandoned windmill in the evening and made camp for the night, Mikos went to bed early. The next day, he was just as unresponsive as ever. Without interruption, the group rode on up to the hill, at the foot of which was the small oak grove with the clear spring. That evening, Mikosh did not eat with the others. From the campfire, Bibi saw him climbing a hill. He was looking to the south, where the Zendro stud farm was located. But then his eyes wandered more and more towards Hotobaji, and even further east, to somewhere far beyond the hills where the valley with the Chico's camp was located. Boys always find it so hard to decide, moaned Tina, who had not failed to notice where her friend was gazing. It's not an easy decision, Bibi defended Mikosh timidly. But Tina stuck to her opinion, and she even went one further. And then they can't even talk about what's going through their heads. Mikosh would have to make a decision the next day at the latest. Either he returned with Bibi and Tina to Zendro Stud, or he rode on with Achikos to the eastern Pusta. Bibi didn't like the last possibility at all, and the thought that Mikosh could join the horse herders forever worried her the entire night. At breakfast together the next morning, she barely managed to take a bite. Bibi was just as silent as Mikosh when they loaded their horses and set off from the lovely campground by the Oak Grove. The last venture through the plains seemed endlessly long for Bibi. They finally reached the hill where the girls had taken their first rest on their outward journey. Here, the group made another stop. The air was hot again, as in the days before the heavy storm. The sun beat down mercilessly from the sky, and its rays flickered over the pusta. Tina stared dozily out onto the plain. When a figure appeared in the haze, she thought she was dreaming. A horseman approached, whom Tina would never have imagined. It can't be, she murmured. It must be a mirage, a delibab. A mirage from Falkenstein? Here? replied Bibi. She had noticed the rider as well as Mikosh, who now jumped up and waved. Alex, he cried. That's Alex. Tina couldn't believe it. It was really him. He took off up the hill at a gallop. He'd barely stopped when he jumped out of the saddle and rushed up to Tina, taking her in his arms. But how, Tina stammered, how did you get here? What are you doing here anyway? Stop, stop, Alex laughed. One question at a time. As it was time to leave, Alex waited with his report until everyone had mounted their horses. As the group started to move, he began to tell his story. The lessons with his private instructor had not been as bad as he had first feared. They had made rapid progress with the material. In the end, Alex had done so well in a re-examination that Count Falco von Falkenstein had allowed him to travel to Zendro Stud. But when I arrived yesterday, none of you were there, Alex remarked. Janusz had told Alex the whole story about Mikosh and how Bibi and Tina went looking for him, and he had decided without further ado to meet them the next day. The evening before, Alex had also talked to Janusz about the idea of school, which Alex was convinced Mikosh should attend. Together, they had finally come up with an idea of a place close to home. There was a secondary school in Kerakesh, and if Mikosh went there, he could always be with the horses in the afternoon. Janusz had been enthusiastic about this idea. After all, Mikosh was needed at Zendra Stud. Well, Mikosh, Alex asked, what do you think of it? Bibi felt everything knot up in her stomach. That was it, the moment of decision. But if Bibi thought that this would enlighten Mikosh, she was in for disappointment. 
The only thing he said was, Yeah, that's all right. It took Bibi quite a while before she understood what that answer meant. That means, she began cautiously, You're staying at Zendro? Mikosh nodded and smiled. Somehow I belong there too, don't I? Bela and Jaspar regretted Mikosh's decision. They could have used an excellent rider like him as reinforcement, but they also thought it was the right thing for him to finish school first. Who knows, said Bela with a wink. Maybe you'll still be drawn out into the wide, wild pusta afterwards. In any case, you are welcome with us any time, Jasper added. Bibi hardly noticed the words of the two chicos. She was elated. What she had longed for so much had now come true, and from now on, everything would be as wondrous as it had ever been. In her well of happiness, she didn't even hear Mikosh yelling over to her. Suddenly, all their horses took off with a gallop. Bibi knew that Mikosh could only have shouted one thing. Whoever gets the Zendro stud first! She drove Tango and chased after the others. Giddy up, Tango, cried Bibi. But Mikosh, who was riding at the very front, could not be caught. He reached the stud farm first, followed by Bela and Jasper. Bibi, Tina, and Alex arrived almost simultaneously. Mikosh had just dismounted Baboshka when Janosch came out of the stable. When he saw Mikosh, his face lit up. My boy, he cried, and ran to Mikosh, taking him in his arms. Tears came to his eyes, and he murmured, I'm so glad you're back home. Mikosh was touched. He didn't say a word and just nodded. He released himself from the hearty embrace and introduced the two chicos to Janosch. Janosch hesitated a moment. Then he took a breath and reached out his hand to the two horse herders. Thank you, he said, for taking such good care of my boy. Mikosh can take care of himself very well, said Bela with a smile, but it was an honor to have him with us. Well, Janosch, whispered Mikosh, I'll bet you don't think the chicos are so bad anymore, do you? Janosch could not hide his embarrassment. He muttered something about, uh, that wasn't meant that way, and actually, I never had anything against the chicos before turning to Bibi and Tina to thank them as well. Bela and Jaspar wanted to say goodbye, but Janosch wouldn't allow it. He invited them to stay overnight, which the two chicos gladly accepted. They pitched their tents on the meadow in front of the stud farm. And now, Janosch announced, we'll celebrate with a bonfire, singing and dancing. While Bibi, Tina, Alex, and Mikosh unloaded their saddlebags and took care of their horses, Janosch and the two chicos piled wood for a campfire. Andreas also joined and helped them. Before long, the crackling flames blazed high into the evening sky, over which Andreas hung a kettle with Janosch's best homemade stew. After the friends had enjoyed their meal, Bela sang an old folk song, accompanied by Jaspar on the cymbalum. The tones of the Hungarian zither sounded both joyful and melancholic. Bela's song was about the old Magyars, who roamed the pusta on their horses. Janos joined in the singing, and after Andreas had also sung a verse, he began to dance. He clapped along with the rhythm. Janos stomped his foot, and the two of them jumped around the fire with a wild, Hey, hey, hey! Not even Mikos could sit still. He took Bibi by the hand, and before she knew it, Mikos twirled her around to the sounds of the cymbalum. Tina and Alex also danced along, they didn't know the lyrics of the song any more than Bibi did, but during the chorus, everyone joined in the cheerful, hey, 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 laughing, dancing, and celebrating the end of their mighty adventure under the glowing stars of a deep night sky. 